Oh 
never say
Here we go! Here are some important updates set for you and your family. The Sea Gentiles for Christ Ministries Church, in its mission to know God more and make Him known, encourages you to take part in God's great work in our city. Keep your spiritual fire burning and do not miss our gatherings. Physical Sunday service of SGCM is back on its regular schedule, that is every Sunday at 2.30 in the afternoon. For those who can't make it, Facebook live streaming will be made available. Just visit SGCM Zamboanga on Facebook. If you're planning to attend next week's service, please contact Ms. Rosemary Bravo for the reservation of seats. Come and join us in praying for our nation as a church. Online prayer meeting every Wednesday at 6 in the evening with the theme, Songs for the Soul, Your Intimacy Playlist. Online intercession every Sunday at 6 in the morning. Jam C Online Youth Jam every Saturday from 5 to 6 in the evening. And this coming November 27, Arrow Online Connect via Zoom. Calling for donations. As we all know, several operations and efforts have been made to help the victims of Typhoon Ulysses, particularly in Cagayan Valley and Isabela. For those who wish to extend aid, here is a list of donations you can make. Bottled water, hygiene kit, clothes, canned goods, and noodles. You can drop it off in the following location. Baliwasan Elementary School, Kulyanan National High School, Divisoria Elementary School, Tugbungan Elementary School, Lunzuran Elementary School, and Regional Science High School. And together, let's make this hashtag Upland Tulong possible. Support a local church activities online by liking, sharing, and interacting on our Facebook and YouTube channel. This is Church. This is Community. This is See Gentiles for Christ Ministries. See you next Sunday. church we are so glad to have you here with us today we believe that god is going to do something great in all of your lives today and that you will be blessed for the tithes and offering let's turn our bible over to second corinthians 8 verse 1 to 4 and now brothers and sisters 
we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they give as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely of their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Despite and in spite of whatever crisis that we are facing right now, may we have the same faith like Macedonians as they never stop giving generously to the ministry of Paul. They give beyond their ability and trust the Lord radically. Have that faith that God will just reward you more than what you asked and expect. Let us pray for the tithes and offering. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you, O God, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to bless you, O God, Lord. God, may you protect those people who will handle your finances, give them the wisdom they need. I pray, O Lord, that these finances will be used for the expansion of your kingdom. May reach out more souls and people, O God, Lord, to know you more. God, thank you for those people who give their tithes and offering. Bless them, O Lord. Protect them from whatever illnesses, O God, Lord. Give them the strength they need, O Lord God. Thank you. And all glory and honor belongs to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We are surrounded in the world by rampant immorality. 130,000 babies were aborted today. Sex trafficking, a $58 billion industry worldwide. Some cultures abusing distinctions between male and female, other cultures ignoring distinctions between male and female. Over a billion people live and die in desperate poverty. Though I would like to insulate myself from these statistics, they represent realities. James says, if there's no mercy in your life toward the orphan and the widow, if you're living according to the ways of this world, and if you don't have a tight rein on your tongue, your religion is a sham. It's worthless. We must speak clearly and biblically and boldly on these things. A global, God-exalting, passionate idealism is exactly what is needed in the Church of Christ today. You can't know this King and be silent about this King. We're compelled to live out our faith in Him, to apply our convictions from Him in every facet of our lives. It may cost us at work. It may cost us in our community. It may cost us according to the government. But we obey Christ regardless of what it costs because we fear God more than we fear men. Let's live differently than the world around us. Let's turn things upside down because we want His gospel to spread to the nation. We want His glory more than we want life itself. Good afternoon, church. Hopefully, you are ready for the Word. For those who are watching us for the first time, we welcome you in our online worship service. This is SGCM. We, need, we exist to know God more and make Him known. We are thrilled and privileged that you chose to join us this afternoon. Para sa mga regular attendees of our online service, we are blessed by your commitment and hoping that you will be able to join our physical service soon. Before I start this preaching, I want to make a brief disclaimer. The possibility that I will offend someone in this preaching is very high. Okay? So I need to be very careful. It is important to clarify that my goal this afternoon is never to offend anyone. Again, I like to repeat that it is not my intention to offend anyone, but to help all of us to discern truth in the midst of lies in disguise. Lies disguised as love, tolerance, peace, joy, and even freedom. Ayos? First disclaimer, let me imitate Paul Washer in one of his preaching. Before preaching a very confrontational preaching, 
he prepared the audience by saying, If I have interpreted this text correctly, then it is as if God himself is talking with you, because it is his word. So if you have anything against it, then your problem is with God and not with me. Those are amazing words to prepare the audience. In the same way this afternoon, if I have interpreted our focus text correctly and you somehow got offended by the word, your problem is with God and not with me. Church, I would like to remind you that as a church, we believe in the authority of the scripture and not the authority of the man. It's not my authority, it's the authority of the scripture. We must come to a place that we don't base our obedience to a preaching to the person, but if it is indeed what the word of God teaches. Because there are people who depends their obedience to the word on the person to the word on the person teaching it to them. It, it's not it's not the word but to the person. Kung sino yung nagpe-preach, doon nakadepende ang ang obedience nila. I have seen many times how the same words are both accepted and rejected by a person because they don't like the person preaching to them. So our rule this afternoon is if somehow this preaching offends you, ask yourself, was the word preached correctly? If yes, your problem is with God and not with me. Okay? Second disclaimer, if somehow you will not like me anymore after this preaching, sana hindi naman, uh, that's a bit sad, but what is important to me is that I have faithfully preached the word of God because I fear God more than I fear men. Claro ba sa atin? And lastly, third disclaimer, is somehow you got offended and became angry with me. You must remember that I am already married. Therefore, I don't care if you will not like me anymore. After, after this preaching, you don't like it anymore? Remember, I'm already married. I have a beautiful wife that I will go home to after this preaching and not like me, liking me anymore will not change that. While you are still single. Okay, joke lang, okay? Plus, I have a cute dog who loves me so much. Keep that in mind as we go on this preaching. Ayos ba sa atin? Tap mo nga yung neighbor mo kung meron kang neighbor na kung ayos lang yun. Sana ayos lang. We are still in our serious counterculture wherein we talk about how we can live in obedience to God in a disobedient world. How we can align to the word of God in a world that treats his word as a non-authoritative. We are in this series for six Sundays already. Sa mga uh, who have joined us for the past six Sundays. Hopefully by this time you have already realized that in order to live in obedience to God, in order to live our lives for God, we must go against our culture as a whole. There are part of our culture that is wonderful, but that cul- but the culture that we want to go against is our culture of murder through abortion, immorality, perversion, addiction, selfishness, or being self-absorbed in any form of culture that opposes the rule of God. Klaro ba yun sa atin? Yun yung against tayo. Our focus text this afternoon, if you have your Bibles with you, is from 2 Timothy 3, chapter 3 to chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. Medyo mahaba yung, yung verses natin. Okay, so bear with me as we read it. Okay, babasahin natin ngayon. So if you have your Bibles with you, open it. it. Says here, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of selves, lovers of money, proud arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into household and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions always learning and never be able to arrive at a knowledge of truth. By the way, I'm reading from ESV. Baka medyo naiibahan kayo sa binabasa ko, okay? Just as James and Jambres oppose Moses, so these men also opposes the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far for their folly will be plain to all as as what as was that of those two men. Then all scripture is it says in verse 10 you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in, my, in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Inconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. 
yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. While evil, e evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for, as for you, continue to what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned, learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Then, uh, one of the uh, favorite verses of many, All scripture is breathed out by God, or God breathed in other translation, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Then, verse 4, in the presence of God, uh, chapter 4, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Medyo mahaba na yung binabasa ko, but bear with me, okay? Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, okay, this is for you. Take this. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Medyo mahaba. That is the verses that we are going to unpack this afternoon. Hopefully you are ready. This afternoon, I'm going to speak from the subject, counterculture biblical preaching again counter culture biblical preaching come on let's do this you know the tragedy in the the tragedy in the 21st century church is that this worldly culture is starting to creep into the church pumapasok na sa church the dividing line that separates the church and the world starts to blur and we have now churches that has a culture that almost has no distinction to that of the world Pare almost same na ang world at ang church. We have churches now who supports homosexuality, who defends immorality, murder of children, and most most of the things that is being taught is about advancement and gratification of self. It's more about motivational speech, really. Even when they say the name of Christ, if you read and listen carefully, you will see that it is about them and not about Christ anymore. For example, one of the most common thing that they say, palagi nito nagikita, if you're uh, palagi ka sa social media, you will see this all of the time. The reason why God did not answer your prayers is because He has something better for you. Familiar ba? They mention God, but it is still about you. Why not rather say the reason God did not answer your prayer is because it is not in accordance to His will? Or the most probable reason is you ask it out of selfish desire or because your life is not lived for His glory. Brothers and sisters, if only we open our hearts, we will see that many of the things we do have the appearance of godliness but denying its power. So, so outside, it looks godly, it's, it looks amazing, but it denies the power as verse 4, 4 tells us. We have this concept that somehow God is glorified by us being more about us. It's about our dreams, our desires, our passion, what we want and God is obliged to grant, is, grant it to us or give us something better. We forget that our Lord Christ said, anyone who wants to follow me must deny himself and take up his cross. For whoever loses his life for my sake will find it and whoever finds his life will lose it. The Apostle Paul warned us in our text, in chapter 3 verse 1 starting verse 1 but understand this binasa natin ito but i will i want to read it again that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self lovers of money proud arrogant abusive disobedient to their parents ungrateful unholy heartless unappeasable slanderous without self-control brutal not loving good treacherous reckless swollen with conceit lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of god having the appearance of godliness but denying its power avoid such people for among them are those who creep into household and capture weak women 
burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never be able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. Naintindihan natin yun? The person who are described in our text has this outside appearance. They appear godly. Their words seems loving and freeing. But the truth is, it is not. They have knowledge granted. Okay, may knowledge sila. But this knowledge leads to nowhere. They say, love yourself. Mahalin mo ang sarili mo. It is about you. God is doing these things for you. You will be great in the future. It reduces God into a genie-like creature. Ah, palagi ko itong sinasabi, but this is what is happening. What's interesting about this text is that least on how people in the last days will act is just as a result of a practice that is so common these days. Ano yung practice, practice na yun that, is a res, that, that resulted to these things? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3-4, to 4, it says there, For the time will come, when people will not put up with sound doctrine, instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Yun yung gagawin nila. Let's break it down, okay? Let's break this verse down. People act like that in chapter 3 verse 1 to 8, yung binasa natin kanina, yung sunod-sunod na mga description. Because first, they do not put up with sound doctrine. Ito yung una. They will say, I don't need doctrine. I need Jesus. Okay? What they mean by this is, they want the 21st century kind of Jesus, who is just all smiles, who does not offend anyone, who is okay with homosexuality and approve of their chosen lifestyle. They will shame people who advocate sound doctrine. Pag talk about doctrine, they like, ah, Ano yan siya? Parang they will label you as Pharisees, legalistic, hypocrites. They will say, aanin mo ang doctrine if walang love. Yun ang sinasabi nila. Char. Then they will only listen to something that will make them feel good, as our text says, to their own desire. Then they will gather preachers to tell them what they want to hear. It is not anymore a pursuit of truth, let alone God, but a pursuit of what makes them feel good about themselves. They want to hear, you will be a success and not, you must surrender. They want to hear, God will make your dreams come true instead of, you must submit to the will of God. They will say, cut off toxic people instead of, reconcile with your brothers or reach the lost. Enjoy life, not endure suffering as a worker of Christ. They will say, let's just preach love. They are so full of love. They are so full of love that they will demonize those who will point them to sound doctrine. So loving. The tricky thing about this feel-good sermon is that they will quote Bible, Bible verses here and there to make it appear biblical, but they are just cherry-picking verses to suit the itching ears of the listeners. In other words, in today's Christianity, what we want are feel-good preachings. We want to feel good about life, about ourselves, above all. About ourselves above all and who can blame us it feels great right it feels freedom not until we see the result of this kind of preaching that we read in 2nd Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 8 make no mistake brothers and sisters those are the consequence of our preaching that constantly gratify the sinful nature when we compromise in the preaching of the word by preaching a feel-good sermons instead of faithful sermons, we will reap a generation of lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedience to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. Saan tayo mga kapatid? We must go back to biblical preaching. Go back to preaching the full counsel of God and not just some cherry-picked verses. For the Apostle Paul, the way to counter the terrible times is to preach the word fully and biblically. So what is biblical preaching? 
How can we say that a preaching is biblical? Ready na ba tayo? Okay. Number one, how we can say a preaching is biblical? It is faithful to the word. Again, it is faithful to the word. Verse 14 says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed or breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I'm excited to unpack this. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Every unbiblical practice can always be traced back ultimately on someone's view of the authority of Scripture. Kung paano niya tignan ang Scripture, doon mo lagi matatrace ang isang unbiblical belief or how they interpret Scripture. One of the cry of the 16th century reformers led by Martin Luther is sola scriptura or scripture alone. What this means is scripture alone is the sole infallible rule of faith. Infallible means not capable of being wrong or making mistakes. Yun ang ibig sabihin natin. Uh, so that's what sola scriptura means. Opponents of sola scriptura will love to point out that even though we claim we believe in sola scriptura, we have other rules of faith that we follow like the creeds. Okay, yung creeds. Sure, we have creeds. For example, the most famous, the Apostles' Creed. Or in our church alone, we have uh, our vision statement. We are a Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, mission-driven church planted in every cities, communities, and nation. Okay? Yun sa church natin. But notice what Sola Scriptura tells us. It tells us that Scripture alone is the sole infallible rule of faith. Yes, we have other rules of faith. Those are our creeds. But these rules are not infallible and are subject to the authority of the Scripture. Scripture is the final say. Okay? The Bible is the final say. Another thing we must consider is the concept of tota scriptura, which means all, all of Scripture. In other words, we interpret the Bible in its totality, not just by portion. Hindi lang yung kuwa-kuwa lang, ganon. We interpret Scripture in the context of the overarching message of the Bible. We don't cherry pick verses to suit our desires. Okay, hindi tayo nagpipili-pili lang. We interpret it in its totality, yung wholesome. Okay? Timothy in chapter 3 verses 14 to 17 was encouraged by Paul to continue to what he learned and stand firm in the Scripture, to plant himself to the Scripture and have no other authority except, except the sacred Scripture. It is the Scripture that can make us wise unto salvation. Marami ako na, 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 na panood na mga debates, hindi yung kagayang debates si Sirana, yung mga totoong debates talaga. So, regarding many issues of life, and every time there is an unbiblical belief, it always as a result of either one of the following, okay? Either one lang dito sa tatlong ito. Reinterpretation of Scripture, number one. What this suggests is that throughout history, the Bible was misinterpreted by the church. Now, while it is true that sometimes the church is indeed indeed committed some misinterpretation that's why we had the reformation okay but there is just teachings today that somehow claims the bible claims are opposite to what it clearly teaches okay even though the biblical stand on an issue is clear reinterpreters insist that we misunderstood the bible for example i listened to a debate about is homosexuality compatible with christianity maganda bang topic yan the pro-debater claims that he believes in the authority of the scripture, he loves the Bible, but we misinterpreted it. According to him, what the scripture is against is not homosexuality itself or per se, but homosexual, homosexual practice outside of marriage. To him, as Apostle Paul is a closet homosexual, and as long as homosexual sex is done inside a loving marriage, then it is permissible. Yun yung interpretation now. Now, if you read all the verses about homosexuality, there is no way you will be able to say that it is what it says. But somehow, by reinterpretation, by forcing the text to say what it does not say, you will have these stunning conclusions. Really sad conclusions. Now, sadly, this practice is already mainstream in today's Christianity. 
Most Christians today will say that they believe in the Bible but wait until they open their mouth or post something in Facebook. And you will see that what they believe is a reinterpretation or a misquote from the Bible. Yun ang usually. How many times have I read this verse quoted in a wrong context? I don't know kung ilang beses ko nabasa. The, the suffering you are going through right now is nothing to the glory that will follow. Nabasa nyo ba to sa social media? It is somehow now suffering is your failed love life or because someone is mean to you, then the glory that will follow is somehow your life will be turned around soon. First of all, the suffering here is to suffer for Christ and the gospel. Okay? And second, the glory to come is not an assurance that things will get better in this life. Because sometimes it will not. Tanungin nyo yung mga, tao, yung mga persecuted Christians right now. But the glory to come is when we are already in the presence of the triune God. Okay? That is the glory to come. But hey, somehow Christians still shares it. Number two, recalibration of scripture. Those who recalibrate scripture will not hesitate to admit that to them, the Bible is an outdated book. Again, I watched a debate where the debater without hesitation said that the Bible is behind in its time, that some, some of the Bible should not be read anymore. In fact, in fact, some of it is a product of the ignorance of the writers. Can you believe it? Like when it is against homosexuality, they call it homophobia. Here they openly admit that they pick only what is to them is acceptable in our times. And to them, teaching that are unchristlike, unchristlike must not anymore be given considerations. Yun yung, yun yung sinasabi nila. The question is, who decides what behavior is Christ-like if the scripture is not authoritative anymore? Hmm? Your guess is as good as mine. It is them who decide. Sila ang nagdi-decide. Eventually, the Christ that they worship is not anymore the Christ that is testified in the sacred scripture. It is an idol birthed from their own imagination and standards. Many Christians today do not know that they already fall in this category. I hear Christian now say something like this, Yes, that's what the Bible say, but this is my situation. Instead of, I know this is my situation, but this is what the Bible says. Instead of interpreting our situation in light of the Word of God, we let the situation tell what the Word of God should say. It is a dangerous rock to stand upon. Now, the, the Word of God is subordinate to our situation. Number three, rejection of Scripture. Flat out rejection of Scripture. To those who believe this, the Scripture is just a ridiculous old book that used to help us to try to comfort ourselves when we lack understanding. Now that science can explain everything, we don't need scripture anymore. But the truth is, there are a lot of things that science cannot answer. Like, what's the purpose of life? Why are we here? Science can... can hindi yun na, na, nasasagot ng science. When someone fully rejects the authority of the Word of God, it is no wonder that we start killing babies or kill each other. Because what is the basis that it is wrong? Who decides what is right or wrong? What is the authority? I don't have time to fully unpack this, but the evil that you see in the world right now is a product of rejection of God's word. I fully believe that. How many of you believe that? Reinterpretation, recalibration, and rejection. This is how the word of God is treated in churches and outside of it. And as a result, we see our society degrade. We must go back to biblical preaching by being faithful to the Word. Apostle Paul has a very high view of Scripture. In chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, it says there, all, Apostle Paul said, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. For Paul, Scripture is the only sufficient basis of belief. That's why our preaching, in order to be biblical, must be faithful to the Word. Amen? So, why is Scripture sufficient? Okay, let's unpack this. Why is Scripture sufficient? Number one, because Scripture is theonustas, or theonustas, God breathed. It means through the Scripture, we are provided the very voice of God, 
And because there is no higher or equal authority than God, then what the scripture says as it is God brief is the ultimate or final authority which is by definition an absolute authority. This is ultimately a question of ultimate authority. What is the ult ultimate authority for Christians? That is the question. Okay? Not only the scripture is the omnustas, it is also the only thing in the possession of the church of Jesus Christ that is God brief. Are you with me? Number two, we say scripture is sufficient because it is the only thing in the possession of the church of Jesus Christ that can make someone thoroughly equipped for every good work, as verse 17 says. The two words thoroughly equipped are two words in the Greek. Uh, bear with me for a moment. Let's do Greek a little bit. It's the word artios and exartizo. Artios means fitted, complete, perfect, having reference apparently to special aptitude for given uses. While exartizo means to complete, finish, to furnish, furnish perfectly, to finish, accomplish, as it were to render the days complete. Yun ang meaning nila. If you look at the definition of those two words, it seems redundant. But there is a reason for it. According to the Net Bible Commentary, okay, so Net Bible, it's a new Bible and meron siyang commentary. Maganda yung Bible na yon. If you don't know ano yung Net Bible na yon, you can just do research. Ang sabi doon, this word referring to Artios is positioned for special emphasis. Merong special emphasis. It carries the sense of complete, competent, able to meet all demands. If you combine all those definitions and commentary to this verse, you will see that Scripture is sufficient to make the servant of God perfectly equipped and able to meet all demands. Amazing. So we can say that Scripture alone is already enough to make the servant of God perfectly equipped to do good work. So when someone says that you cannot just use the Bible all the time or label someone with Bible bashing, using the Bible to bash people, they're actually arguing against the sufficiency of the scripture. In my experience, I have noticed this happen especially when I discuss emotional issues with people. What will happen is someone is going to argue something and I will try to answer based on what the Word of God teaches as much as I can. Okay, I'm not perfect, but as, as much as I could, I try to answer people's questions based on what I see in the Word of God. But there will be those who will say, but psychologist says that it is the other way around. Now, I'm not really sure if indeed there is, a, there is really a difference in the approach of the psychologist and the Word of God. But to that person who made the Word of God subordinate to psychology, what you're actually saying is that which is God read, the Word of God, is subordinate to something else. Therefore, the Word of God is not anymore the sole infallible rule of faith. It has now mistakes because it is now subordinate to psychology. Are you willing to believe that? I'll give you a moment to let that sink in. Personally, I believe that everything that we need in life is found in the Word of God. It may not directly address the uniqueness of the situation, but the principles are there. Biblical preaching is faithful to the Word of God. Amen? Biblical preaching is faithful to the Word of God. Number two, Biblical preaching is a call to forsake self. The characteristic of feel-good sermons that really stands out is its focus on self. How it appeals to your inner desires, your dreams, and how they gratify the flesh. It is contrary to what the Bible teaches. Look at how Paul encouraged in Timothy. Uh, how Paul encouraged Timothy. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and suffering that happened to me at Antioch, at Inconium and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, as for you, 
Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. First, Paul alluded to, the, to his teachings, his conduct, aim in life, patience, love, and steadfastness. Okay, he alluded to that. Accordingly, these things resulted for the apostle to endure sufferings and persecutions. Okay, his way of life did not give him a luxurious and comfortable life. And he gave one assurance to Timothy. It's not an assurance of prosperous life, but an assurance that those who chose to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That is the assurance when you follow Christ. Feel good preaching will never tell you of the sufferings and persecutions that will result in following Christ. You know why? Because that's not how they view following Christ is. Their concept of Christianity is not what Paul taught Timothy. Iba yung thought process nila, iba yung thinking nila when it comes to Christianity. Many Christians are followers of Christ because they see Him as someone that will fulfill their wishes and desires. He is someone who will make their dreams come true and give them love life. Okay? Sa mga walang love life. Or make them rich. But who can blame them? It is our fault when we preach watered-down sermons. We make it sound that God is just desperate for us, that He is begging us to be part of our lives. God is begging. Parang yun yung ginagawa ni God. No. Christianity is about forsaking ourselves. One of our goals that one day we will not anymore be about ourselves but about God. When we forsake ourselves, we can go through persecutions and sufferings and in the process, glorify God. We can go through it because we forsake ourselves. In the midst of an evil culture, in the midst of while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived in the midst of this. As for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. We must not be influenced by the culture of the world, but we must counter it. We counter the culture of the world. The world says, gratify yourself, while the word says, forsake yourself. Live for God when suffering and persecution comes as a result of it. Welcome it and trust the Lord's gracious deliverance. And even if He doesn't deliver you in, in persecutions and sufferings, still praise Him again and again. Amen? Jesus was asked one time, What are the greatest commandments? He answered, To love the Lord with all your heart, all your strength, with all your mind, and to love your neighbors as yourself. Both of those two requires us to forsake ourselves. In dalawang yon, it requires us to forsake ourselves. Biblical preaching calls us to forsake ourselves. Amen? Amen ba? Type amen if amen yon sa inyo. Lastly, number three, biblical preaching is focus on God. For, forsaking yourself is not the end of it. Many world religion teaches to forsake yourself, like Buddhism. As mentioned in our previous point, Feel good preaching focuses on self. It promotes promote, promotes yourself. But biblical preaching focuses on God. The goal is to put God in the center where He rightly belongs. He is the point of it all. In chapter 3 verse 4, after listing what people will be in the last days, yung binasa natin kanina na mahaba, the apostle made this remark. Treacherous, reckless, swollen with, con swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Yun yung sinabi niya. Feel good preaching, preach pleasure with... While biblical preaching, preach love for God. Pleasure, then biblical preaching love for God. Everything is done for the glory of God. It is time for us to always assess everything that we hear. Always ask yourself in every preaching you hear. Who is the center of that preaching? Is the preacher always talking about you in a manner that you are the center of it all? Or worse, talking about himself? Does it encourage you to pursue pleasure rather than God? Yun ba ang ginagawa ng mga preaching na narinig nyo? Are they talking about the reality of suffering for the name of Christ? Or the sacrifices you must do like loving those you would rather not to be in a relationship with, reaching out to the lost, giving your hard-earned money to finance the advancement of the gospel, forgiving even if you are unfairly treated, 
or giving your time to serve, to pay evil with good? Or are they promising empty promises such as if you follow Christ, your life will always be alright? Yun ba ang sinasabi nila? Alin doon ang sinasabi nila? Sinasabi nila, your life will be free from problems. You, you will always be favored even it is evident you are not living for Him. Is the preaching centered about you about to cater your insecurities? Let me stress this out again. True biblical preaching is about God, not man. The gospel itself is not preached in its fullness in full guild sermons. They will love to stress that God loves you, which is true by the way. But if you look at the cross and see only love and not the wrath of God against sin, then you miss the point. Listen carefully. The danger of not preaching the gospel in its fullness is there will be no real conversion because there will be no repentance and repentance is required. If unbelievers will not be informed of the wrath of God, they will not see the need of repentance and even if they will say they will choose to accept Christ, they will not be filled with wonder of how great He is, how great God is. When someone is not informed of how great the grace that they have received, they will not live their lives for the glory of God. Only when we realize how great the grace that we have received, then we will be filled with awe and gratitude that, that will cause us to live life for the glory of God. Amen? We were lost, but because of God's grace, we were found. We are destined for destruction, but because of God's grace, we are saved. Titus chapter 2, 11 to 12, another one of my favorite verses. It tells us, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. The true grace of God makes God the center of our lives. Again, the true grace of God makes God the center of our lives. Amen? Chapter 4, verse 1, Paul charged Timothy. He says here, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing in His kingdom, I give you this charge. Yun yung sinabi niya. Yun yung charge niya. This charge not only reminds Timothy what he should do, but also to remind him for whom he is doing it for. He is doing it for God and Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead. God is the main character of the story, not us. Biblical preaching exalts God. Biblical preaching unpacks who God is. It leaves you in awe of who He is and repentant of who you are. Again, it leaves you in awe of who He is and repentant of who you are. As the years go by, I am more convinced that true biblical preaching makes us put God in the center of our lives, called us to a life not pursuing earthly gain, but losing for His name's sake. Amen? To conclude this, verse 3 started with the list of how bad humanity will be in the last days, and indeed, we see it now in our world. The world will become darker and darker, but there is hope. And that hope is when the people of Christ rise up and preach the gospel of hope. That is the hope, when we preach the gospel of hope. In the darkness of the world, God's, God's light will shine through His people. Yes, it will be difficult. There will be sufferings and persecutions, but we must carry on. Let me read again 2 Timothy 4, chapter 1-5. And let this be your takeaway verse. SGCM, take this. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing and his king, in His kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires. They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth, turn aside to myths, and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. That is our takeaway verse. In these dark times, 
We must preach God's word faithfully, forsake ourselves, and focus on God. Whether in season or out of season, in victory or in defeat, whether we have plenty or lack, we must counter the culture. Let our preaching not be feel good, but be biblical. God bless us all. As we end this, let us close this with prayer. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray that the words that was spoken, O Lord, will indeed be engraved upon the hearts of your people. Lord, it is a difficult preaching, O God, and probably it offended some, O Lord. But I pray that the reality of your word will really be real upon your people. And God, they will understand the heart of your servant, O Lord, and they will know that, God, this is your word, O Lord. I pray that you open everyone's heart indeed, and I pray that, O oh God, you will even reveal more, O Lord, as they meditate upon the word, O Lord, this afternoon. I pray that you're going to continuously enable your people, O oh God, to walk with, in your ways. I pray that, Holy Spirit, you're going to teach every your people to, to, to follow you, whatever the situation, whether in victory or in defeat or even in lack or in plenty, O God. Lord, I leave up to you, your people, and may your grace, O God, Lord, indeed guide them. Lord, dismiss us with your love as we finish this online service. May the fruits of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit be the portion of your people. I declare love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And may the love of God the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be our portion this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless us all. See you next Sunday.